here, would you guys worship with us as we celebrate Jesus' resurrection?
Christ alone.
the announcement guys good morning cross point and happy easter uh, my name is grant welch and i'm coming to you from welch headquarters here uh, during this crazy quarantine time this is soren's corner where she's learning all about her alphabet and doing uh, special projects throughout the weeks and missing her church family on the weekends uh, so hi soren it's good to see you uh, I'm here to share with you a couple announcements that we have for you today. First of all, thank you for joining us. Albeit online, we're really grateful uh, to be worshiping the Lord together with you wherever you are located around the world right now. It's kind of unique. We'd love to connect with you further no matter where you are. So we have a digital connect card that you can fill out or you can also type in connect on the live stream feed. Uh, which I believe is to my left. I might be wrong on that one, but just type in connect and we would love to follow up with you. Uh, my role at Crosspoint is that I'm the pastor of our second site at Crosspoint West, which meets in Rosemere. As you know, all the schools in the Vancouver School District are closed uh, indefinitely, at least uh, this school year is for sure closed, which put our plans to move our Friday night worship service at Washington Elementary School on hold. We're just paused. Uh, today would have been our very first Sunday service uh, if we would have transitioned to Sundays, if we were allowed to, but God had different plans. It's a great time for us to continue praying for Crosspoint West and the transition from Friday nights to Sunday mornings when we're allowed to do so. Uh, it's a great time to pray and ask yourself, is this something that I would consider joining in uh, to reach the people of Rosemere with the message of the gospel and partner with the people of Crosspoint West? Uh, so please continue to pray for us and with us uh, and consider joining us um, when we can uh, move our worship to Sunday mornings. We are eager to get going uh, and resume what God has been doing in Rosemere. I also want to explain to you a hashtag that we've been using since we're all so scattered and we're uniting on certain days of the week, like today on Sunday. Um, it's hard to keep in touch with everyone. So we've created a hashtag. It's hashtag CPBC Cocoon, C-O-C-O-O-N, C-P-B-C Cocoon, Cross Point Baptist Church Cocoon. We're in this stage where our lives are on pause and we're almost like a caterpillar where we're in chrysalis. We're waiting to blossom and get out in the world again and experience things all over again, like restaurants and places and friends and social interaction. Uh, but we want to stay in touch in the meanwhile. So as you are cocooned, we would love to hear what you're doing, all the silly things in life, all the fun projects you're doing with your kids, how God is using you um, to bring peace that passes all understanding to people in your lives. Uh, but we would love if you would use that CPBC uh, cocoon hashtag, uh, and we will keep track of what one another is doing. Uh, please join me now, though, as we pray for our service. God, thank you so much for this day. Lord, we thank you for everything that you've given us. Lord, today we remember that you gave us your life. Lord, uh, you loved us to death, even death on a cross. And today we celebrate that we have joy, Lord, because you rose again from the grave, showing that you are Lord over the grave. You're Lord over everything, especially the things that we're most afraid of, including dying. So Lord, we praise you and rejoice in who you are, the sacrifice that you've paid to redeem us, because we could not redeem ourselves 
So Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for your sacrifice. Lord, we love you and we want to be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Crosspoint, given our circumstances with schools canceled, weddings being postponed, jobs getting laid off, we wanted to survey you and see how you're responding to the pandemic, and this is how you responded. Uh, what's your name? I'm Shad Gatson. My name's Dave Jones, and I'm a fence contractor. I'm Joy Bradley, a third grade teacher in the Evergreen Public Schools. My name is Mark Berklin. Hey, y'all, my name is Ford. Hi, this is Danny. And Lori. Just finishing up now my 36th year of teaching. I can honestly say in those 36 years of teaching that I had never taught to an empty couch. Given the circumstances, what kind of emotions do you feel? And I feel very confused and conflicted. And I'm an extremely relational person. So just being away from um, you guys is just really hard and I'm a hugger and I love to be with people I love not being able to do that has been tough well, I'm not necessarily sad about like school being closed and stuff but I am sad about my softball and that I don't get to see my friends from softball the part that is hardest for me during this time is that I didn't have a chance to say a proper goodbye I have not been able to work as the state has a shut down so it's been very frustrating knowing I've got stuff to do and not able to do it. As I'm trying to work from home, also trying to help my kids with their school stuff, plus trying to make sure that my wife has the space that she needs to be able to get her work done um, as well. So we're all trying to make it work. We left school that Friday, um, anticipating to come back to school the following Monday with their books and things are still on their desks ready to come back for learning but instead my classroom is empty and their chairs are empty you all have become my church family so just being away from um, you guys is just really hard and it's empty um, I'm not able to hang out with friends because it helps the time go by you would think as official empty nesters we would be used to this feeling but this is very different and we both realize that we feel very empty without the actual physical presence of our friends and family. Uh, even trying to do it online is not near like being there and being able to give a hug and, and encouragement. So it's been a lot of emails, it's been a lot of phone calls, a lot of video conferences, there's been a lot of stuff and uh, it gets very tiring and overwhelming looking at a screen all day. I've missed out on the friendships with my life groups that I belong to and the interaction that we have. I'm hanging in there and making the best of it by staying in touch with them via Zoom and trying to encourage and love and support them that way. So this gives us an opportunity to pause, to reflect, to think about those things. That God is in control that he is leading me, it's going to be better in the long run. That people will not take for granted the friendships that they've developed and continue to work harder on making those friendships stronger in the future. Um, but I pray that we will get through this and one day be able to hug one another again. Good morning, everybody, and happy Resurrection Sunday. This is the day that, of course, Christians all over the world celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And the truth is, we don't only celebrate the res resurrection of Christ on Easter Sunday, but actually every Sunday, and truthfully every day, if you're a follower of Christ. Yesterday I uh, went on a bike ride, and I like to, to do that when the weather's nice, to kind of think a little bit and, and just get some exercise in. And as I was riding along, rolling along, I guess, I got to thinking about this weekend, the very first time... Uh, of the resurrection, the very first weekend. Of course, Friday was a day of grief and pain. And Saturday was a day of fear and doubt. And then you get to Sunday and it's a day of joy and, and celebration. And uh, as you think about the situation that we're in today in our country, in our world, you probably feel like the people on our video from our church. There's a lot of emptiness and, and, uh, and confusion and doubt and even grief about What's happening? I read this morning that now we are at 110,000 deaths with the coronavirus, 21,000 in the United States. All 50 states, for the first time in history, simultaneously have, uh, by the president, been declared a disaster area. 
And I was looking at a, a guy who was commenting on this a few weeks ago, and here's what he said about the virus. He said, the primary concern is not the current sickness and death count, it is the potential devastation this disease could cause. The influenza pandemic that struck in 1918 affected one-third of the world's population. That would be about two and a half billion people in today's population. It's estimated to have killed between 50 and 100 million people. To put that in perspective, the total fatalities in World War II are estimated between 70 and 85 thousand million people. So it's easy and it's normal to have a, a feeling of emptiness when this kind of situation is upon us. And I must confess that um, I think other pastors feel the same way, but pastors battle this temptation, especially today, because Easter Sunday for a pastor is like Super Bowl Sunday. I mean, it is our, it is our big day. You know, we have the biggest crowds, we have the most guests coming. We, we have the best conversations with people that are looking for a church. We have all kind of things going on that were scheduled this weekend. Uh, most of them were canceled or done in some different way. Friday night, we were to have had a, a Seder service, which is a Passover meal, where we explain the significance of Christ as our Passover. Yesterday morning, we do our annual uh, community Easter egg hunt at Silver Star Elementary, which is a huge hit. And then, of course, today we would have had multiple services and also launched our first church plant, Cross Point West. And so all of that has kind of been pushed further into the future. And it's, it's tempting, and I confess, I have moments where I feel some, some sadness, some emptiness. Even today, you know, uh, this is the first time since uh, years ago when I was deathly sick in the emergency room on Easter Sunday morning that my wife and I have not been to church on Easter together. And so it's, it's just difficult. It's, it's challenging for so many people. Everything kind of is empty, isn't it? Churches are empty. Restaurants are empty. Uh, hotels are empty. Even, even the swing set in our neighborhood is empty. Like you can go into the park, but you can't even get on the swing. And I really just want to go swinging, you know. But uh, it's empty, so I can't, I can't do that. Some people are feeling empty. Some people are feeling lonely. Some people are, are sad. Some people are scared. At least one person I know is angry. I went to uh, get a pizza a couple weeks ago when all this was just starting. And uh, I, our local place where we like to get pizza was closed for everything except pizza. And so we did a, an order like everyone's doing now, you know, to go. We have to come in, get it, and go. And uh, they weren't quite ready, and so the guy was um, fixing my pizza, and he asked me my name, and I told him. And there's just like, he just looked like he was mad. And uh, it's awkward, because I'm the only one there, and so I wanted to just say something to break the awkwardness. And I said, um, so, how are you guys doing in the midst of all this? That was the wrong thing to say, because he just about blew a gasket. And he refused to look at me or talk to me. He walked around. Uh, he, was, he was sort of muttering under his breath, and it was so weird. And, and he came back, and he, he took my credit card, and uh, he saw my name again, and uh, he said, Jim, <laughs> I can't even describe it. And that was it. And he angrily went back to work, and I walked off with my pizza. There's all kind of emotions that are raging during this time in our history. And uh, I, I have to say to you also, though, that these same emotions were involved in the very first resurrection weekend. This is the last uh, of our four-part series called Our Savior. We've talked about his, his temptations, his teachings, his triumphal entry, and today we're going to talk about his triumphal resurrection from the dead. So we're going to be in Luke. We're going to begin in uh, chapter 23 and then go on into chapter 24. So please uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 23. Let me give you a clue of where we're going next week. We're going to start uh, a series called Eight, and this is simply uh, eight messages from Romans chapter eight. And, and what better place is there to be than Romans chapter eight? Not only for our current crisis, but it's my favorite ch uh, chapter in all the Bible. So I, I look forward to, to starting next week. But uh, let's talk today about some good news. In the midst of all the bad news, there is some good news, like um, 
John Krasinski, he is, uh, he's become pretty famous, right, with his, with his YouTube special, Some Good News, and people are watching him, and he's funny, and there is some good news in, in the midst of the bad news. In fact, good news really stands out for us as believers. This, this first Resurrection Sunday, there were three emotions, some of the same emotions that we feel today that were present. Let's look at them. The first emotion that I see here is grief. Jesus was dead. Jesus was dead. Uh, this is Luke 23, verse 44. It says, It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. And then the next two verses, it's interesting. It says that the the centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. All four Gospels talk about the role of women, not only in the the resurrection of Christ, but just how involved they were in Jesus' ministry. And this was really unheard of in their day, to elevate women to this position. And, And yet Jesus and the Gospel writers continually did this. We see that although all the disciples deserted Jesus, the women stayed with him to the very end. If you look at uh, chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, we see an example of that. After this, it says, Jesus traveled from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him, and also some women who'd been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna and many others. These women were helping to support uh, them out of their own means. And then since we're in chapter 23 already, look for just a moment at verse 57. Chapter 23 and verse 57. Um, Well, great, there is no chapter 23, verse 57. So, believe me, there's a verse in there. Oh, here it is, verse 55. The women who'd come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. So we see that the women were with Jesus during his ministry, and they were with him when he was on the cross, and and they even watched as he was taken down from the cross and as he was buried, and that's going to be important in just a moment. They, They were experiencing great grief and trauma in their lives, and grief is a powerful emotion, isn't it? Many of you know because you've experienced it in some way, whether through a death or a divorce or disease or just disappointment in, in what you expected to happen, but it didn't happen. And that's where all the disciples were. They expected Jesus to be their, 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 their reigning king. They expected him to rise up against the Romans, and instead he was crucified like a common criminal on the cross. And so everyone was feeling grief. And you've heard the expression, uh, time heals all wounds. Well, it doesn't. (laughs) Time helps, but time doesn't heal. I think about those even today. I know of some people who uh, have gotten married out of state and their family couldn't come to the wedding. I know of some people during this coronavirus who have lost a loved one and there couldn't be a public gathering, a public funeral to celebrate their life. There are other people that are grieving today because someone they know or maybe they themselves have the virus and they're not sure how it's going to turn out. Listen, we live in a, quite honestly, a broken, painful, sinful, grief-filled world. And, And being a follower of Christ doesn't eliminate that from your life. There's turmoil, there's tragedy, there's heartache, and it's everywhere and it's all around us. And if it hasn't found you yet, at some point, it will. People are either going into something, they're in something, or they've just come out of something. And grief is a common emotion that we deal with. There's another emotion that I see in the story, and it was fear. Fear, Jesus was, was missing. 
Jesus was missing. Fear is an emotion we all can relate to as well. From that same article I was reading earlier, this person writes, as you know, this pandemic has caused many people to panic. Fears are rising around the world. People who have never felt anxious before are suddenly weighed down with worry and are not sure what to do next. Travel is banned. Schools and businesses are closed. Many small business owners are hurting financially. People are uh, panic buying, hoarding toilet paper and hand sanitizer. I think one of the reasons that viral outbreaks are so scary to so many people is that you can't see the enemy. Germs and bacteria are microscopic, so you never see them coming. If infected people or surfaces had a glowing green aura or something like that, we would know who to avoid and who not to touch. But we can't see microbes like uh, viruses, and that, I think, just escalates people's fears. Look at the fear that's here in chapter 24. So the, the women, of course, went home, and uh, Friday happened, and then there was a very long Saturday, and now it's early Sunday morning, chapter 24, verse 1. On the first day of the week, <clears throat> very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And, and so, in Mark, when you look at all four of the Gospels, in the, in the book of Mark, Mark tells us that the women, as they were on the way, were wondering who would roll the stone away. And imagine the shock when they got there and the stone was already rolled away. And we know why, looking back, it's easy for us. We know what happened, but they had no concept of a resurrection. And it's really interesting to me, I, I haven't finished studying this, but I found at least 10 places in the Gospels where Jesus told his disciples and his followers that he was going to die and rise again from the dead. But this had, this had never really happened. I mean, Lazarus rose from the dead, but he died again. No one had ever really risen from the dead like Jesus was talking about. And verse 5 mentions their, their fright. Um, how frightened they were. And part of that is because they saw an angel who was telling them these things. But part of that, part of that was just their, their fear over what had happened to Jesus. He, the one that they loved so much, he was alive and now he's dead. And to make matters worse, he's not even at the grave. He's, he's gone. Uh, I don't know what you want people to say at your funeral. I heard a guy say one time that what he wants people to say at his funeral is, Look, he's moving, <laughs> you know. So I guess you're not really dead then, right? But, uh, but I don't know what you want people to say, but, but this is a shocking time in their lives. And the reality of the missing body of Jesus was a problem for everyone in his generation and, quite frankly, for everyone since then. You know, people have to deal with Jesus in some way, don't they? I mean, there's no doubt as to the historicity of Jesus, uh, you can go to any encyclopedia or any history book, and there's talk about Jesus. In fact, there's more, there's more evidence and records of his life and his existence than almost anyone else who's ever lived in that period of time. And, and so you have to figure out what to do with Jesus, and, and especially uh, in that day and time, they had to figure out what to do with the missing body of Jesus. And so there are three main theories that people have have pushed back then and even today so they can rationalize away the supernatural. You know, that's what we want to do. Like, it's hard for us to believe the supernatural, and so we come up with excuses, and sometimes the excuses are crazier than the supernatural event themselves, and these are three examples of that. The, the first uh, approach is to talk about the fact that the body was stolen, the stolen body theory. Matthew records, by the way, that story where the authorities went to the soldiers and paid them a, a sum of money to say that the disciples stole the body. And uh, that, that's a crazy one if you think about it because these guys were professionals. And their one job is to guard a prisoner. And probably the easiest kind of prisoner to guard is a dead one, <laughs> especially one who's dead and buried and, and, and been, um, been locked up behind a large stone. And uh, what's interesting, though, is their excuse would never hold up, would it? Their excuse was that they were to tell people, and this is what they told people, while we were sleeping, the disciples came. 
Now, just chew on that for a moment. While you were sleeping, how do you know what happened? <laughs> While you were sleeping. The disciples came, and they, they apparently stole the body. But the disciples were never arrested, and no one ever found the body of Jesus in his generation or until today. And so that's kind of a crazy theory. Another theory that, is, that was popular for a long time is the swoon theory. And that theory teaches that Jesus didn't really die on the cross. A lady had called into a Christian radio program, like an, one of these uh, question and answer programs, and she said to the host, she said, hey, I need to ask you a question because our pastor told us in church yesterday that, that Jesus didn't really die. And so he didn't really resurrect from the dead. He just wasn't dead. And somehow he got out of the tomb, etc. What do you think about that? And the radio host said, well, here's what you need to do. He said, have your pastor uh, beaten 39 times with a whip with sharp objects on it. Have uh, spikes put between his ankles and his wrists and hang him on a cross where he hangs for a number of hours and, and beat him. And then, and then when he comes down and he's dead, take a, a spear and pierce it into his side and then take that body, <clears throat> and this is what they did in those days, and wrap it in about 90 pounds of mummification and, and put that in a grave uh, and then put a large stone in front of it and then see if your pastor can revive himself, take off all those grave clothes, by himself move that stone away, overcome all the Roman guards, and go off merrily along never to be heard from again. I mean, some of these ideas <clears throat> that people push are more miraculous than the miracle itself. And then the, the final theory that's often uh, mentioned is that the women went to the wrong tomb. If you look at... Uh, if you remember chapter 23, verse 55, the women saw where Jesus was buried. And if they went to the wrong tomb, so did everyone else. The disciples went to the wrong tomb. The Romans went to the wrong tomb. The Jewish authorities went to the wrong tomb. Everyone who wanted to find Jesus went to the wrong tomb. Crucifixion was a public event, and so it's really um, unheard of that people wouldn't know where he was buried. And the Bible tells us that a rich man named Joseph took charge of his body and buried him, and, and in those days, people knew Joseph, and they knew where his tomb was. You see, sometimes Christians are accused of having blind faith. The fact is, we have faith, but it's not a blind faith. It, it's a faith that has stepped into the light. It, it's a faith that's based on facts. And everyone takes the same set of facts and they interpret it the way they want to. And honestly, at least given these three theories, the belief that a supernatural God could raise Jesus from the dead makes more sense to me than all of them combined. You know, grief is a real emotion, <clears throat> and it gives way many times to fear, which is a real emotion. But then the greatest emotion of all comes out. We've gone from Friday to Saturday to Sunday, and that's joy. Jesus was and is alive. And, and chapter 24 is all about things being opened. When you read the chapter, maybe reread it this afternoon or read it around your, your, your brunch uh, time today, and, and what you'll see, or your lunch time or your dinner time, you'll see that the tomb was opened, eyes were opened, minds were opened, and mouths were opened. Listen, churches may be closed today, but the tomb is open. The tomb is empty. And, and we have great joy and celebration with Jesus Christ. Look at uh, Luke 24 and verse 36. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and at my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. While they still did not believe it was... It, I still did not believe it because of joy and amazement. He asked them, do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. So we see in this passage, Jesus was not a ghost. 
<laughs> he showed them his wounds. He was hungry. He wanted something to eat, which is normally the first thing that I do when I wake up, and that's what Jesus did, right? Like, hey, it's, it's, I'm awake. Uh, what is there to eat, you know? And, and so he had a meal with his disciples. In verses 44 to 49, he helped them see what his life and, and death and resurrection was all about. And he commissioned them to go and, and tell everyone and anyone that they could that he is alive. And Luke picks up the story in the book of Acts. So Luke wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And if you read the book of Acts and, and read it sometime and just highlight the word joy, notice all the times that the disciples were filled with joy. And most of the time, it had to do with them sharing the good news about Jesus in a hostile environment. Their joy came in a most unlikely time. And our joy oftentimes comes in the most unlikely of times. Joy comes through obedience and through passing the faith on to others. Friday was a day of grief, but Sunday was a day of joy and celebration. It was a day of unparalleled joy. So let's just take this message and, and boil it down to two things. First of all, one thing to know, we have joy when we find and follow Jesus. We have joy when we find and follow Jesus. The church that I planted back in 1998, that was the mission statement for our church, helping people to find and follow Jesus Christ. And that's all that we were about. That not only was a mission statement, but it was what we experienced. When we help someone come to know Christ, there's no joy like it. When, when people give their testimonies of becoming a follower of Jesus, you can see the joy in their lives and all over their faces. I remember the day that I became a Christian, almost like it was yesterday. Okay, it was 40 years ago, but it's almost like it was yesterday. I was so excited and so thrilled, and a peace came over me. I'd been searching for so long for purpose and meaning and reality in life, and I was frustrated everywhere I looked and everything I tried to do, and then a family told me about Jesus, and the day that I gave my life to Christ changed everything, and joy, joy came in, and it hasn't really ever gone away. You say, well, Pastor Jim, are you happy all the time? I didn't say happy. I said joyful. You see, happiness is based on what happens to you. Joy is based on what Jesus has done for you. And that, what happens to you changes every day. But Jesus never changes. And so even in the midst of my own grief and, and, and my own fear and doubt and sadness at times, there's this deep joy that's never left. And that's a joy that you can experience too this resurrection Sunday morning. Jesus loves you. He loves you more than you ever could love yourself, more than anyone else loves you. He loves you to the max, and, uh, and he died for you. He came into this world and, and took upon a body. Imagine God taking a body and went to the cross and, and took all of our sins on his body on the cross. He died on that cross, and then he validated the victory that's ours by rising from the dead. And I just want to encourage you to find and follow Jesus. Now listen, when I talk about finding Jesus, it's not like he's hiding. <laughs> uh, there are so many churches that are online this morning that are proclaiming the same message about the reality of faith in Jesus Christ. When you put your hope and your trust and your faith in Jesus, the one who came and lived and died and gloriously resurrected from the dead, you become a child of God. And, and, and I encourage you to seek Jesus, just to pray. That's what I did as a 15-year-old. I, I just knelt uh, beside my bed, never prayed before, didn't know what to say, and, and somehow from my heart just verbalized that I wanted God to forgive me and for Jesus to come in to my life. That's the one thing to know. We have joy when we find and follow Jesus. So, so give your life to Christ if you haven't already. And then the one thing to do is tell someone the good news. That's what the disciples were commissioned to do. It wasn't just that they had breakfast with Jesus, they ascended back up into heaven, and they lived happily ever after. They were given a job to do, and that job was to tell someone the good news. Listen, you have circles of influence that no one else has. No one else has the same family that you have. 
No one else works with the same people that you work with. No one else has the same neighbors. No one else has the same friends from high school. You have a, a tremendous circle of influence, and no one can work that circle except you. You've been placed in a neighborhood, placed in a city, given a job, given an assignment by God so that you can be a missionary in that location. Tell someone the good news. And listen, I've been finding, well, this is true every year around Easter Sunday, people are more open to spiritual things than they've ever been before. And it's even more true because of COVID-19. Uh, people are dealing with grief, and they're dealing with fear, and they're wondering what's going to happen, and, and, and there's just a lot of eeriness. I, feel, I felt like this on my bike ride yesterday. It was such a nice day, and there were people out and about, but it, there was still just a feeling of eeriness and emptiness all around town uh, because most people are staying in like they're supposed to, but I, I was not within six feet of anyone, right? And, and uh, because of that, people are open to the truth about God and His Son, Jesus. Listen, the virus is bad, no doubt about it. But God is good, no doubt about it. And, and He's using this bad thing in our lives to give us the opportunity to share the good news with other people. So Friday, Friday was a day of grief and pain. Some of you are living today in Friday. That's a hard day to live in, the day Jesus was crucified. Saturday is a day of fear and doubt, and in some ways that's even harder because now the, the pain is over uh, and you're just not sure what God's going to do or how God's going to respond or where God is even at. And then Sunday comes, the day of joy and celebration. Listen, if you want to know this Jesus that we've been talking about this morning, I want to encourage you to reach out to us in some way. There's a lot of ways you can do that. You can email us. You can literally call us. Some people still use a telephone to call people. You can do that. You can text us if you would like. You can comment right now on, your, uh, on the live stream. If you just say spiritual encouragement, those words, uh, we'll follow up with you, and we'll let you know how you can know Jesus. What, what a great opportunity that we have today to be alive, to be living in this time of history, even though the, the times are so bleak. It's so great that Jesus is alive, and we have hope and joy and victory in Him. Let me pray for us. Father, I do pray today that You be glorified and honored even in the midst of this terrible virus. Lord, I pray that You would do a work that only You can do. I pray that many people listening to many different churches today, mostly online, uh, God, would hear the good news and respond in, in some way to that good news. God, thank you so much for the hope that we have in Christ. Thank you for the joy that we have in Christ. Thank you that in the midst of, uh, Lord, pain and grief, fear and doubt, we have joy and celebration because Jesus is alive. He's alive forevermore. And one day, we will join him in death and in that moment where we're absent from the body, we'll be present with the Lord resurrected just like he was, to spend eternity with you. God, we thank you for that, and we praise you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.
his victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King.
everybody. Have a wonderful celebration.